everybody. Welcome to another episode of Artful TV. I am Eileen Paratris, and along with my co-host, Hal Rains, we are bringing Rains. a show to you of artists talking about art. Today, we are lucky enough to have some incredible guests named Craig and Olga, who are master puppeteers with a show, with a studio actually, and a business out of New York called Flexitune. So we'll talk to them about their work in our third segment today. But first, we're going to hear from Hal about what he's been doing and what he's been up to in his pottery studio. Take it away, Hal. Hey, everybody. Um, I love working with underglaze. You probably figured that out by now. And because I use underglaze so much, um, a lot of my pieces take on color and um, they sell really well. So, you know, uh, so here I am again today using underglaze in my work. So let's just take a look. Okay, so this is speedball underglaze. I, you know, it's if money is tight for you, at times it is for everybody, I think, typically. You want to use an underglaze or some material that's not quite as expensive as others. And that speedball fits that category and it tends to hold its color even at a very high fire. So um, that's the green. Um, you've seen me use that before. Unfortunately, it's not a chartreuse, but you can make a chartreuse if you wanted to mix some yellow with it and a little bit of white, and then throw some green in there. I mean, some um, blue in there for extra measure. Okay, artist. Now, I don't know about you, but really, we all come from positions or backgrounds where um, artists and muses tend to color our worlds. <laughs> Fun. Uh, anyway, color our worlds in interesting ways that if we don't have those people in our lives, we're going to miss something. So for me, the people that really made a difference for me as a potter was my friend Becky Dunn. She was actually my wife's teaching buddy, and they taught together at Lincoln for a long time. Anyway, Becky had a show, and I wanted to see her work, and it kind of led me down a path that brought me to pottery. So... Here I am using purple under glaze. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I love purple. And I think purple makes everybody look better. It's just the color of royalty. And, you know, even, even if you're really old and haggard looking, you put on something purple, you're going to look pretty good. <laughs> At least that's my theory. Okay, so Scott Holmes. Yeah. Scott Holmes music is the one that's there most of the time in the background when I'm working. And uh, I love his, his music too, because he lets me use it for free, which you know, if you're doing a budget video, um, free friends, you know, friends will let you use their work, you know, it's just a wonderful way to go. And it keeps the cost down and you get the quality and they get the exposure. So and I'm using water there just to bring the color of the clay out and just a little more water to, uh, to spin that color and get that uh, to look in a way that's a little odd and kind of a throwback to the 60s. So I happen to be a kid of the 60s, so, you know, there you go. Craig and Garrett, those were my two mentors that actually get me rolling. Uh, Becky and Clay Mix, that's where I get my work done. And Rin Lee has been a guest on our show. Jeez, uh, does the people that are there, Hunt Prothro, I collect his work. I just love it. Janet Haig is a Holocaust survivor that just passed through the stream. And um, her work is just truly remarkable. She does everything by hand. Hand building is her forte. So uh, I'm going to use the black there and you can see I'm just kind of spin it out and then I'll change the speed of the wheel so it throws that that uh, color way out there, which is what I, I truly enjoy a lot. And this also reminds me of Wayne Bates. Um, you might want to look him up. He's still um, alive and his work on eBay is pretty expensive, but he's, he's still with us. So there's really no reason to buy his work on eBay when you can actually get it from him and have a great conversation with him uh, when you're looking at his pieces. So anyway, um, that's really pretty much what I need to say today. It's just uh, get some clay. You can always reach me at halrains at sbcglobal.net and you can talk about your process or if you see something that I do and you want to do it, you know, fantastic. So anyway, that's it for me today. Eileen? Well, I love the uh, effect that you had on the uh, water, I think when you put it in the very center and it splattered out and it made that design yeah. on the center of the pottery. Right. 
that was really fun to see because it just happened like in a split second. And I love nice. to see that kind of effect right away. And so is that something that you've worked with over the years to figure out how to do that effectively the way you want it? Or does it just, you do it and you see what happens? Well, interestingly enough, well, for me, it's interesting anyway, uh, you could play with the speed of the wheel, you know, um, there's sometimes I'll put a really heavy layer of underglaze on the wheel, you know, I mean, on the pottery, and I'll spin it at just the right, uh, the right pace to keep that underglaze in check. So it spins it fast enough, so it's not going to spread out, nor does it allow it to, you know, kind of wobble and wonk in. So uh, you get a really nice chubby layer of underglaze that you can use to carve through and get beautiful garlands or, or bands of color. So it's just something you play with and hopefully find the right technique that works for you. And uh, it's experimentation, which is what, you know, we all do, so. Exactly. <laughs> I, I just love to see your work too. Your work always grabs me, you know, and, and I can't wait till this <laughs> pandemic is over where we can, said and talk about your work and maybe you uh, have a quesadilla at quesadilla gorilla i would love to that. <laughs> right. right by you well thank you well my pieces today that i'm sharing with you are all from 2010 it was a series i did called rituals and the work uh there's five pieces that i'm showing you today and there's more pieces that are in the whole series but i chose these five uh, the reason why I called it Rituals is because at the time I was kind of rediscovering my own uh, roots in the long, far away back time to where um, I've learned of Aztec ancestry and other things that uh, tie me back to Mexico. And so there's a fascination through the years, even to this day, that I do an altar at Dia de los Muertos time. And it's a ritualistic tradition that you do in that whole setup. And so when I made these pieces, I had that in mind. So let's look at the first piece. This is called maintenance. And the thing about each of these pieces is that they're all the same size. They're uh, 40 inches tall by 30 inches wide. And then the center little rectangle is actually three inches wide by four inches tall approximately. And so every single piece will have that same setup. But as I treated each piece a little bit differently, I wanted to have a different focus subject. And in the very center of this is a little tiny uh, human figure. And each part of the figure is a different part of the landscape. So the head is the sun, the upper torso is the sky, and then the green grass is right around the waist. And then there's uh, going into the leg and then there's the terra, the dirt that goes into the feet. And so that really the idea of maintenance for me is about how we have to in our regular daily lives of rituals that we do to keep ourselves healthy there's a lot of maintenance and i for one hate maintenance i hate all the stuff you have to do on a regular basis but obviously you still have to do that in order to stay alive you have to brush your teeth you have to comb your hair you have to do all the things you usually do to uh to be human so that's where this piece comes from and other things that you'll notice is that on the actual artwork there is a little bit of thread that I have sewn into the canvas. Some of it is painted into the background so it stays still and others are hanging more loosely and moves whenever wind hits it. And then the center little rectangle, again, beyond just the painted piece, there's a piece of organza fabric that I've sewn over it so that you see through a fog of a fabric to see the inner, the uh, singular piece in the center. So now this next series, uh, Next piece is called Nourishment. And in the very center of this is a molded strawberry. And the whole idea behind this was because there's a give and take, I think, with the things that we find nourishing for our lives. Uh, we can go towards things that we think nourish us, whether it be food or the people that we are friends with or the experiences that we have that we think nourish our lives and make us a better human. But there are also those things that turn bad and become you know a bad thing to us and so then that's the molded part of the strawberry that it's all part of who we are there's good and bad in all of the nourishment that we take in and it's up to us to figure out how to survive among all that and and eke out the best version of ourselves in that so that's where the idea of nourishment comes from and then the next piece is called prescription and the center of this little uh, black square, or not square, but rectangle, is a pill bottle with a bunch of little pills in front. 
And the idea on this one was um, slowly, of course, watching my husband go through his kidney situation as we were gearing up for whenever he would need a transplant. He was taking a lot of medication uh, necessary to keep him alive and to keep his kidneys functioning up until the point where he could get the transplant. And so even in my own life at the time where I was healthier and not going through cancer like I am now, uh, everybody has medication at different times. And of course, this relates then to the fact that I, relevant to today, I went through cancer treatment. I was also um, having to take a lot of medication for what I was doing at the time, the chemo and the radiation. So at different times in our lives, we have to deal with medication that keeps us alive or helps us survive whatever it is we're going through. And that's again, an, another ritual of our daily life. This piece you'll see is a little bit different than the other first two. It has a little piece of uh, fabric going across the top that I've sewn and have little threads hanging from that. And then the center piece does not, has a little piece of fabric that's actually tiny and sewn into the prescription bottle. So the very tiny little gray square you see in the center is sewn on there. Now going on to the next piece, this one's called Slumber. And this was another set. I did three different sets of effects in this series. And uh, this piece where it's mostly black except for the green uh, rectangle lines that you see. And then there's again thread that's sewn in those little black narrow uh, up and down sections. And um, the center rectangle has a little drawing of a bed frame. And there's a little fabric that's sewn on the top portion of that. And then there's thread that actually works into both the fabric and the uh, bed frame itself. And all of the white that you see there, I actually rubbed it on. I used a piece of a sock actually and just put paint on it and rubbed it very carefully into the canvas on the black. And so it could get that uh, gauzy effect. But the piece itself, Slumber, is really relating to all the rituals we have of needing rest, needing to take time to be with ourselves, and then of course the final slumber, which is our passing on and transition into death. Mm -hmm. And then the final piece I'm showing you today is called emotion. And you see it's very similar to the green piece. So it's the same kind of uh, feeling that I wanted to create here. But with each piece, I did a little bit different treatment as you can see. And so this yellow, very bright yellow is further out from the center rubbing and uh, the area then within the little tiny rectangle is an anatomical heart. And I sewn some fabric and some thread again into that. And there's also that thread you can see in the long, narrow um, black streaks on the inner side there. And so all of it is, even just as I was making the pieces, they were ritualistic for me because it was the rituals of creating the same type of feel amongst three different uh, treatments in the whole series. So you had the first two that were a part of three and then that third one prescription that was a part of three that the other two have sold as well. And then these last two uh, that were also part of three. And so very similar in feel and trying to give myself a boundary of trying to be ritualistic in the way that I approached the work and created the work so it would feel like the altars that I create every year for Dia de los Muertos. Yeah. So that's, you know, wow. what I did with those. And again, it's always reflecting on the things that I'm going through at the time and then just trying to make sense of, um, you know, anything and trying to put it into the work so other people can relate to it and feel something of their own when they see it for themselves. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, I, those Thank lines you. On, on the sides of those, you know, not the last one, but the well, the last one had it as well, but the lines that you have are really indicative of, of our birth, you know, through whatever, and then we get to the other place where we're facing the end of the journey, you know, right. it reminds, uh, reminds you of the confines within that, like the dash mark. I remember reading something as a middle school kid about the date on the headstones, you know, I mean, that whole existence is represented with that one dash. So, right. Yeah. You know, you've been very it's generous with those two lines. <laughs> You're making you. the dash. <laughs> well, you know, we hope our lives are long and we get to experience a lot of fun stuff in between, you know, and learn a lot of things along right. the way. So I think that's always the, the thought as we're working through it. And then we hope that the dash for our lives amounts to more than just the dash. So. <laughs> right, right. 
Well, thank you so much. Um, today, our guests are Olga and Craig, uh, Craig Moran and Olga um, Felgemacher. Sorry, I goofed that up. Olga Felgemacher. They design, build, and perform puppets and marionettes for stage. Uh, they have quite a, a, a pedigree. They were part of pe Nickel. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. They were part of Nickelodeon's first series, Pinwheel, along with George Carlin and um, Ringo Starr as the jukebox band in the Shining Time Station. And the Talking Stain, you probably will remember this if you're even a little <laughs> bit old school. Talking Stain, that was the Super Bowl commercial about a guy who had a stain on his shirt and the pocket pocket, uh, pocket was uh, just jamming about keeping it clean. So with that, <laughs> Peg and Olga, there you go. Take it away. <laughs> guys you know that's really strange we haven't seen that in many years and we did that in 1993 we edited that reel together so we've been doing, yeah, we've been doing so much sense to, and look that's us too from 1984 and we're still doing the same thing yeah. basically yep i'm still collecting fabrics and scraps and all kinds of things that's how she met me <laughs> Were you selling the quilt? You know, we just... <laughs> <laughs> Not this lifetime. No, but uh, if I had to, I would oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd make a costume out of it. No, no. Um, I just love puppets. Yeah, you know, it's like, a, it's there's an alchemy with puppetry. We call it the alchemy of puppetry, as a matter of fact, because uh, puppetry is truly an amalgam of all the arts. You need to be able to do everything in order to bring it to the final place of presentation. So in our case, we need to be able to design, to sculpt, and then to make molds, make costumes. Carve. Carve. All those different aspects go into it. And since we make them ourselves, it's kind of like a, uh, a race car driver who builds his own car. We know what where, where the heart engine beats from. So it comes in from, from our souls. And we start talking like the characters while we're making it. We start infusing them with personality. Right. And, and they always change as we're building them. Right, because we're not making little homunculi. We're trying to get the essence of what the character is, hey, the he spirit. Took offense. He took offense at the homunculi thing. <laughs> um, Although if we had to make one, we would. Of course, yeah. yes. But, um, you know, we've, we've been doing puppets our whole life, individually and collectively. and. Um, Olga worked with uh, Bill Baird. And Most people know Bill uh, from the puppet scene and the sound of music, the Lonely little goat herd. Lonely yeah. goat herd. Yeah. But he had a theater in Greenwich Village and he did commercials, Elsie the Cow commercials in the 50s, for late 40s and 50s and 60s. He was he was he was the Olympus of puppetry. <laughs> That's, that's right. And then she went to work with the Muppets and did Sesame Street and the Muppet movie. And then then we met. And I've been doing puppets since I was basically three years old. My father was a cartoonist in vaudeville, and he and my mom did this act where they traveled. They look so much like us. <laughs> look at my mother and father look just like us. How did that happen? But they, uh, <laughs> my father would do chalk talk where he would take uh, numbers and letters. There, there you go. Are. And uh, and he would take those numbers and letters and he would draw cartoons out of it while doing snappy patter. And it was called Paul Marin, the Chatterbox cartoonist and his blonde Georgia model. 
And he worked with the uh, Phil Silvers Phil and the Three Stooges and uh, Minsky's. He did the Minsky's burlesque tour. And so when I grew up, he was drawing cartoons for me. And uh, instead of telling yeah. me a bedtime story, he would draw the cartoons and do the voices of the stories he was telling. So for me, it was a question of the, the cartoons on the page jumping out into three dimensions because it's a three dimensional reality that we're both that we're both after. Yeah, that's what I like about puppets. It's they you can make in three dimension reality the fairy tales <laughs> and and the imaginary realms that you you dream of. It, you can make them real and make them talk to you. <laughs> yeah. See, that's a, that's another thing that's different with animation. With animation, there's a long process before it can come to life. Whereas as we're building the puppets, they're coming to life. And that's that's where this art leaps off from, from uh, others that are meant to be on a pedestal or hang on a wall or something like that. All of the, the puppetry has that as well. But the final step is when we perform. When the puppeteer sends life into it. Right, that's it. It's nice to be bring a mouse to life. A mouse? <laughs> or a butterfly. Yeah, except the real mouse running around here. <laughs> And a lot of times now, we show kids how to make puppets. Made out of stuff. So here's a bunch of puppets that we show children how to make. Ooh, that rooster's probably blood. There's a milk carton cow. With a bottle lid. With his bottle nose. caps for the bottle eyes and uh, the nose there. And this, of course, his nose is athletic cup. our son's athletic cup once he was through with it. So. This is actually a Hershey chocolate syrup thing turned on its side and a mouse with uh, peanut butter jar lids. So when we, show when we show children how to make puppets, that's the way they know that it's something that they have around that they, they can uh, access themselves and then uh, they'll have that satisfaction of bringing it to life. But when we're going to make a, a puppet, we usually start with, with the idea that we need something. Sometimes we don't need anything, we just need to build it. But in, in, in the most recent case, we needed to make we needed to make like a, a bus driver character. So we, we, we started with um, the idea that he had to be zany. Can we see these lines? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you see the lines? Oh, good. Okay. Yep. And it had to be zany. So we uh, worked on an expression that really kind of uh, encapsulated the spirit rather than the actuality, the spirit of the character. So this is Charlie. And uh, once we kind of approve it the way that looks, then the next <laughs> oh, thing we no. the next thing we would do would be to sculpt it out of clay. I don't have Charlie's clay head here, but here's a here's a clay head that we're working on right here, and we try to get it as as uh, extreme as possible because we don't want to copy people we want to leap off from people you know whoever, whoever your personal duty is does better job than we would as artists but for us to take that as the raw material and then stretch it and expand it so people recognize themselves in it without it being that like looking at a cloud you could look at a cloud hal and see a diamond and eileen could look at a cloud and see a dragon and you'd both be right, right. right. so we try to right. we try to infuse it with the idea of the character rather than the specificity. That way everybody can begin to see their own thing in it. And that's half that's half the thing that we need to do there, right? Right. Yeah. And then um, after we uh, we do that, we make a mold. And uh, I use the, sil the silicone mold material Sometimes here. Sometimes we use plaster yeah. or hydrocal. But this is nice. Uh, These are nicer. What's really nice is we've kind They're of- Not as messy to work with. And we've eliminated, see this, this the inside of, that's the negative of Charlie. And so oh, when we okay. cast it, it becomes a positive. We cast it in something like a plumber's epoxy or paper mache, because we've cut out all chemicals. We used trying to use yeah, elastic or plastic wood or any of that horrible dye stuff. And it's hard enough. I don't want to die to make puppets. I want them to give me life. Right, and we want the planet to continue. Yeah, right. so we try, the only, only, the only chemical we use now is like five minute epoxy. And that's, then only when we have to. That's right. Yeah. Because bubble gum, yeah. but uh, so then once we make once we do that where we make the the mold, then we'll cast it. Then Olga would start to figure out what the costumes are going to be like, 
And like she mentioned earlier, forever she's been collecting Since on I every was a tour. kid, I have to tell you, since I was a kid, scraps, pieces of fabric, um, yeah, hair. This from the sack of onions. You know? <laughs> because you you never you never know when wolves might very nicely yeah. turn into the wings of. Yes, I'm from New York, and my uh, my wings are made out of onions. <laughs> they bring tears to my eyes. <laughs> yeah, that's Cuckoo Rocha. I started out as a kid collecting scraps from uh, dressmakers that lived in the neighborhood and my grandmother and the colorful things and kept them in cigar boxes. And then I realized the other day we went to one of our storerooms. I have floor to ceiling, big plastic bins with yards of fabrics. And when we travel and you see something that's the right scale for a puppet, it's like, oh, we have to buy a few yards of this. So, and sometimes uh, I'll say, for what? She'll say, I don't know. And I'll say, that's good. <laughs> but well, you remember thing, this though, guy here. Inspiration comes from all areas. And so you see something and it makes you think of the possibilities of it. And what I see yeah. with all those scraps is that's like every other artist studio where we have all kinds of supplies with us at all times because you never know where you might use it for something. You never exactly. know. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's where inspiration comes from. Just seeing a crack on the wall can inspire a whole character. And so, you know, if you open, if you take off your your blinders and you're open to that kind of thing, all of a sudden over there, something is something you never saw before. Right, and the and, fire hydrants yeah. talk to you. And uh, if you want to go chasing those those uh, rabbits, then that's the way to do it. And so, you remember this guy we had here. And so, the fi the final step was to to paint him. And this this is him. This is our prototype of of Charlie, right here. Oh, oh. love him. <laughs> and uh yeah so he's he's the prototype and when we do when we do our next show we're gonna have like three or four different versions of him hand puppets marionettes this is a this is a hand puppet and here's a marionette you see it all begins with the control uh-huh <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's king coin here he is over here inspired by fats oh. waller here you can see he's carved out of wood, where he's supposed to be carved out of wood, and his mouth moves, and his eyes go, and he has a, everything is jointed so it can move. He's supposed to wear clothes, but we just love the nakedness of the Yeah, I can't, so. I, I can't put a costume on him. I put that black necktie on him, and it was just, that's all he needs. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes, well, thank you again, man. Craig and Olga, for being here with us today and sharing your amazing work and all the uh, thought that goes into creating your puppets. We really appreciate it. And thanks again, Hal, for showing us all your pottery stuff. And I'm glad I could share my art with you today as well. So we hope that all you all will, will join us again next time when we have another episode of Artful TV. Until then, we'll see you later. Take care, guys. Bye. Brush off the clouds and cheer up, put on a happy face.